Chapter 17, In the Dark of the Night. Notes. Thanks for the reviews and kudos, I really appreciate your support. I hope you like the new chapter, I never feel super comfortable with very descriptive sex scenes, so I kept it rather tame, I hope it is still readable. Also TW mentioned suicide attempt. Chapter Tex. Chapter 17, In the Dark of the Night. The next morning found Khan relatively well rested, and a lot more excited than he would care to admit. According to Anya breakfast was the only meal they would not have to take in a proper dining room, and it had been delivered by the cooking droids directly on the coffee table of their shared living room. There were some fruits already cut in pieces, pastries he didn't recognize, some kind of red jam, and a calf pot that smelled heavenly. He wanted to try everything at once, and could already feel some weird mixture of frustration and disappointment at the idea he would probably not be able to in one go. Anya got out of her room as he was pouring calf on both of their cups with a small scowl, dressed in training clothes, and with her lightsaber at her belt. She sat near him, greeted him with a quick peck on the lips that made his heart quiver, and started explaining what the different things on the platter were, and what pastries the jam was supposed to go with. It unsurprisingly didn't help call his desire to take a bite out of each of them, and when he checked if any of the sweets would be available later that day, she quickly doused his last hopes. Serenians traditionally didn't eat anything salty before lunch, but ate little to no sugar at other meals, an old custom that stemmed from a tale about a group of kids bringing pastries to their elders in the forest. As the day faded into night, the spine wolves came out of their den and ate all the kids that indulged on the pastries on the way there, leaving only the trustworthy ones alive. The belief that spine wolves only ate those whose blood was sugary had been dismissed centuries ago, but the tradition of only eating sugary things at breakfast to have low blood sugar at night when the wolves roamed remained. Anya told him that multiple versions of the tale existed, but that the first ones insisted a lot more on kids staying on the right path, and not trusting the wolves, renowned tricksters, than on the content of the little basket they were supposed to carry around during their journey. She supposed it had been altered at some point due to food shortage on Sereno, restricting their access to sugary foods. He found it rather hypocritical since apparently any good life day dinner would include dessert, and people generally didn't care about that specific rule at parties. Unwilling to share his disappointment, he nodded along distractedly at regular intervals during her explanation, while devouring a raisin bun, a spiral-shaped pastry filled with custard and dried raisin, that simultaneously crunched and melted in his mouth, and tasted like heaven. It was nearly good enough to make him forget the other temptations sitting on the table. He had gotten his body back for more than a year now, closer to two really, but food was still a permanent source of amazement, after spending 20 years being injected with nutrients, his tongue too damaged to taste anything he tried to ingest with rising frustration in his meditation pod. He dreaded the day where it wouldn't be. Do you like it? She asked with a smile. He raised his thumb, mouth still too full to talk, and she pointed to another pastry, a circular shaped chew cut in two halves, sprinkled with icing sugar, and filled with elegant swirls of base cream. This one is my favorite, it's called a Karania Safia in commemoration of a famous Serenian speeder by Grace. She divided it in two and put half of it on his plate, slowly cutting through the rest, and eating it in careful and elegant bites. He took a sip of calf to rinse his mouth from the taste of the delicious raisin bun, knowing that at this point he was indulging more than feeding himself, and tried Anya's favorite. Chris she had taste, perhaps not in men, but at least in food. The raisin bun had been amazing, but this was on a whole other level. The praline cream, airy chew, crunchy almonds, an overall mixture of textures creating a symphony of pleasure in his mouth that nearly made him moan. Nearly. Khan was still riding his sugar high when they joined Deku in the Citadel training rooms half an hour later, fighting to keep a smile off his face and his hands off Anya after the passionate morning makeout session that had followed breakfast. He had a feeling he wasn't the only one who regretted spending their first night on Sereno alone when a much nicer option had been available. Fortunately, there were very few things in the galaxy that were more efficient in taming the impetuous throes of his passion than Count Deku's stern face. He looked as regal as usual, dressed up in full combat gear and feeling like a viper in the force, tightly coiled and ready to strike. Clearly, they didn't all have the same expectations on what training would entail. The training room itself was gorgeous, with high ceilings and enormous windows that opened on a gorgeous view of the gardens below, and were reflected on the opposite wall, made entirely of mirrors. It had some sculptural benches and even a table on a side with refreshments already waiting for them, as well a padded section that was probably used for acrobatics and stretching. After a quick warm-up with katas and stretches, Anya volunteered to do a first mock duel with Khan, while Deku watched and gave them pointers, leaving Khan to duel Deku afterward while she would rest. Blades ignited, and set to their lowest energy setting to reduce the risk of injuries, Khan and Anya saluted each other traditionally with a short bow, and started the duel with some easy stances, Anya favoring Suresu, while Khan stuck to Gemso, barely putting power behind their strikes, in order to gauge where the other stood. She was better than she had been on Corellia, her form less wobbly, her reflexes attack quicker, and her guard trickier to pass without overpowering her with brute force. 
Obviously, she had kept practicing Terra's Kasi, and the thought of her sticking to it warmed his heart pleasantly. Progressively he opened himself to the force, and his blood started coursing faster through his veins, their conjoined excitement and satisfaction humming pleasingly through the bond as their superficial thoughts leaked through, feeding them with information on the other's next moves. Fighting Anya felt like having fun with a friend, the force purring loudly as their signatures meshed, pawing playfully at each other with no intent to harm. Duku pointed Khan's open flank and Anya's weak wrist with a bored tone. In sense, he increased his speed, and Anya matched him, going through the motions faster and stronger, their attacks now more powerful, including some elegant and precise Makashi strikes and retreats for her, and aggressive and acrobatic Atera blows for him. She nearly got his wrists a couple of times, trying to get him to drop his weapon, while he forced her to move, making the energy-saving style she favored hard to maintain. Underneath their focused faces and sweating bodies though, nearly visible now, their bond was singing in elation, bubbles of joy and laughter popping all around them. After dragging it on for way longer than he would have usually, he ended the fight with a somersault that allowed him to attack from above, his chocolate blade clashing against her green one, breaking her guard, and unbalancing her enough to make her drop her weapon when she tried to parry. Sulla she said, panting lightly. They bowed, smiling in a tad out of breath, and Khan realized Deku had stayed silent. He was standing on the side, his right hand petting his beard, eyes sharp and narrowed in curiosity. Anya poured them both a glass of water from the pitcher, brought by a service droid earlier, and sat on one of the benches, a bit more winded than him. Seeing her sit seemed to break the spell the Count was under, and he stepped closer, giving them an appraising glance. Impressive. I rarely saw you fight at that level, Anya he praised. She smiled and inclined her head humbly. Thank you, Uncle Yan, it pleases me to see you satisfied. He smiled with the type of warmth that seemed reserved for Anya, and then turned to Khan, nodded in appreciation. Beautiful duel, Mr. Vayner. I didn't know the Shans could fight like this. We are taught all forms before being knighted, though I never dueled at an interesting level before meeting Anya he replied after taking a few sips of water. The raised a brow, but didn't point out it implied they had fought before, something that he doubted Anya had shared with him. I hope you still have some stamina. We shall see Khan replied with a small smile, projecting genuine eagerness at the idea of fighting Deku. The older man softened at his words, probably remembering other young and promising students that were once just as eager to duel him. He gestured towards the center of the room, and Khan emptied the rest of his glass before joining him, exchanging a reassuring look with Anya, before igniting his blade again. The Count Blue Blade shone brightly, his presence in the force expanding slowly until it touched his, more cautious than the first time he tried it the day before. It felt like scales against scales, his own presence unfurling against Deku's, fangs and claws politely hidden, for now. They clashed once, then twice, the blades vibrating even at low power, little sparks casting weird shadows on their faces. The experience was somewhat different from his previous duels with Deku, the man keeping his barbed tongue for himself, and clearly not intending to maim or kill. It was a challenge, slowly increasing in speed, his strikes precise and controlled, targeting painful but not vital areas, to patiently wind him down with costly parries, while he kept most of his energy. Deku was a master in his craft, and he had perfected Makashi in a way that was even more obvious when he had no need to actually kill his opponent. About a minute in, Khan realized he was having fun. He wasn't the only one who noticed, or the only one who enjoyed himself for that matter. Deku's dark eyes were glinting with mirth, and the tiniest of smile elevated the corner of his lips. As he did in his duel with Anya, he started to expand his repertoire of forms, leaving pure gems so for his modified Ater, and alternating with breaks of Ceresa parries and deflections, to avoid exhausting himself too much wielding the two very physically demanding forms. Deku's style was, like Anya's, a good counter to his since Khan usually relied on fast overpowering moves, and tended to exhaust himself if he fought too long in his favor's stances. Against Anya, though, who liked the choreography more than the fight itself and had no real desire to win, Deku Sr. was a competitive duelist through and through, and it was starting to show. Are you winded, Mr. Vayner? He taunted nearly playfully. Khan huffed in amusement. Are you, Count Deku? The older man smiled wider, his teeth showing in a predatory way, and Khan felt the dark side gain more ground in the man's presence, powering his blows with renewed strength. The dark was whispering in his ears too, pushing him to match Deku's state, but Khan refused himself to it, sticking to the light to grayish balanced version of the force, he was trying to learn how to channel under more tense situations. He let his presence grow though, extending around him as he let the power, raw and barely tamed, swirl around him. Deku pushed with the force, trying to unbalance him to take the advantage, but Khan didn't move a toe, withstanding the attack without even acknowledging it. The count looked at him, surprised, and they traded blows for another couple of minutes before he tried again, this time to avoid a direct attack. Again, his attempt was thwarted, but Khan held his hand before dealing what would have been a deathly strike in a normal fight, allowing Deku to put his blade under his chin. Sala Khan drawled somewhat arrogantly. 
He bowed, waiting for his opponent to mirror his actions, and a Flomox Yanduku repeated the gesture a few moments later, extinguishing his blade. They moved back to the benches for some much needed water, Khan feeling sweat cooling quickly on the back of his training top and his forehead as the adrenaline of battle started to wind down. Overall it went well, setting his raw power level as high but somewhat unrefined, without showcasing any of the abilities he would prefer to keep secret. Anya looked half amused, half amazed, having never seen either of them fight so intensely before, and Deku was pensive, gulping down his water with furrowed brows. Your worthy opponent, Mr. Vayner he finally stated, his gaze unreadable. Surprisingly nice, the man had never been one to hand out praise for free, in their previous encounters, and he had thought his proximity with Anya would be a perfect reason to dislike him in this life. Thank you Count Deku. Deku didn't react and instead pressed on with the question, visibly intrigued by his performance. Do you usually use the force when dueling? Khan shook his head. No, this was the first time I tried, outside of powering my tear. I could show you more uses of it if you are interested he offered, his tone bland, while his eyes glinted with possibilities. I am. Fighting seemed to have warmed the taciturn Serenian, eliciting something that wasn't unlike grudging respect. Khan felt similarly, and if he still had consequent reservations about Count Deku, he also thought it wouldn't be too hard to play nice for the remainder of their stay on Sereno, if the Sith Apprentice behaved as he did at the moment. Anya seemed to come to the same conclusion, and felt visibly pleased by their cordial interaction, emitting waves of warm affection through the Force. Both men looked at her, suddenly remembering they had an audience. She smiled softly. Watching you duel is extremely entertaining. The raised a brow. I am delighted that you appreciated the show. Anya didn't seem to take umbrage at his sarcastic tone, and smiled before rising and stretching a little, obviously anticipating the rest of his training. As she had anticipated, Deku asked them both to go through the katas of Form 2, correcting their stances as they went, making them repeat each move until he found them adequate. When they finally got out of the room everyone was sweaty and suitably tired, and Deku left them for his own quarters after informing them he wouldn't be attending lunch, but would see them at dinner. Khan spent an undue amount of time under the warm spray of the luxurious shower of his assigned bathroom. He felt more satisfied than he had been in a long time during training, having been pushed to a pleasant exertion by Deku's rigorous teachings, and he had to admit his hate for the man was decreasing with each contact they had. It seemed like when he wasn't determined to hate him with passion, they actually could spend time together without any verbal attacks or killing attempts. He was still a pretentious prick, of course, but a somewhat tolerable one. Once he was finished he checked his data pad quickly while drying his long hair, and smiled at Jared's message. They had agreed to meet the following day for dinner and drinks in Karania, where the other boy lived, and he was looking forward to seeing his friend again. He joined Anya for lunch after getting decent again, enjoying another go at Serenian cuisine with some roasted bird and vegetables that had both very nice texture and incredible flavor, before heading back to the training room for his first dreaded dance class. He felt a tad sore from his morning, more than a bit nervous about the mere idea of dancing, and cringed visibly when he saw that Anya had taken her data pad, probably to put in some music. His throat was dry, his hands moist, and unease was creeping up his spine, twisting his mouth in an uncomfortable pinch. Anya seemed to feel it and put a hand on his shoulder, catching his attention before capturing his lips in a comforting kiss. Khan relaxed slightly, his eyes closing as he leaned into it, but she drew back before it could go any further. He opened his eyes, frustrated, and stiffened when he met her knowing gaze. Think of it like a kata we would both do in cinch, you lead, and I'll follow she said calmly, trying to assuage his discomfort and failing. I'll show you the basic steps for the most common dance I know, and we can go from there. He swallowed awkwardly. What is it called? He mumbled. Could he still get out of this? The chorus can't you waltz, if there is an event organized in the core, you can be sure there will be at least one of those. And he would absolutely not dance at any core event, she could forget that idea already. It's mostly turns, either clockwise or reverse, with additional steps to change the direction of the turns. She positioned herself in front of the mirror, gesturing for him to stand beside her, and showed him the first moves. Forward, side, legs together, back, side, legs together. It looked even worse performed alone, but if he was honest with himself, he had to admit it wasn't that hard. They repeated a couple of times until he got the hang of it, and managed to relax his stiff body into moving in a vaguely human way once again, then she stepped in front of him and took his left hand, while her left hand made contact with his shoulder. Put your right hand a bit behind my shoulder, and we will try together, I'll count. Khan nodded, jaw clenched. It felt both less and more intimidating now that he was about to do the real thing. Repressing another bout of unease and his growing need to flee, he put his hand in position as indicated, and felt her reach out to him through the force, not unlike she had done this morning when they fought. Pouring into the connection from his side, he saw her smile and nod, and she started counting. The damn thing seemed easy at first, but after a couple of basic turns, she stopped, praised him, and introduced even more steps. 
once he got those down, it progressively got a lot faster, and he would have been lying if he said that he hadn't stepped on her toes at least once. It was infuriating, really, that he could perform every kata taught at the temple with incredible ease, but struggled with something most of those stuck-up gits from the core had learned when they were still children. Still, practice and praises seemed to flush away his unease with each successful turn, and after around an hour of annoying music and awkward missteps, he had enough mastery of the technique to make her twirl around on the sound of a popular core scanty compositor that wasn't as terrible as he had initially thought. Grudgingly, he had to admit it was nicer than expected. Anya looked and felt happy, her body warm against his, and the high-speed turns had an exhilarating quality that wasn't lost on him. Something between pleasure and yearning rose in his chest, heightened by her fierce elation, and his feelings clashed with hers in what felt like heady steam in the force, leaving them both hot, breathless, and greedy for more. The intensity of the moment grew steadily as they spun around, eyes locked, and suddenly he realized he had no true desire to stop anymore. When the song ended he let go of her regretfully, his heart beating wildly, and gave her a mocking bow as she grinned, cheeks pink and gaze still glinting from the rush induced by their dance. Anya then took back her datapad, breaking the moment, and it felt like everything he had bottled up regarding their relationship, came back to drown him in icy water in that exact moment, fear slowly rising in his gut as he observed her flushed face. Khan wanted more, and he knew he shouldn't. Images flashed through his mind, naughty, improper ones he was too afraid to entertain. He could go for it, he could tell she wouldn't oppose him, not now, but wouldn't that be preying on her, taking something he wasn't sure she would give him if she knew the truth, his truth. He was already in too deep, each interaction cementing his attachment further, increasing the risk of something going terribly wrong, and he still was too much of a coward to tell her how dangerous their relationship could be to themselves. What if he hurt her, physically or mentally? What if she wasn't ready for this? What if she regretted it afterward? What if this was the reason why she hadn't manifested any desire to join him last night? He had to get a grip, and if this was the effect dancing with Anya had on him, then he would not reiterate the experience. He followed her absent-mindedly to their quarters, feeling the sharp sting of shame when she grabbed his hand with a sweet smile, unaware of his wicked thoughts. They entered their shared living room, the door closing behind them, and he was ready to dart back to his room for a very, very cold shower, when she pulled him towards her. Her lips crashed into his, igniting the fire in his abdomen he had so much trouble taming, and before he could think about what he was doing, he was holding her waist like a lifeline, and stumbling towards the nearest piece of furniture. His body started burning when they nearly fell on the couch, entangled in a mess of limbs as their mouths met again and again, greedy and craving so, so much more. He let her lips alone, grazing her exposed neck with his, enjoying the breathy gasps his actions provoked, when he found a sensitive spot near her pulse. She looked perfect like this, flushed, lips swelled by their kisses and eyes glazed in pleasure and steaming, boiling hot desire. Khan had to stop this, he knew it. This was getting too far, too fast, and his self-control was slipping away from him, his young, eager body betraying his earlier reflections without an ounce of remorse. He couldn't let himself get carried away, not when there was such a strong chance that she would regret it afterward. He had to protect her, from him and even from herself. He had to stop this. He gathered his strength, ready for the disappointed look he could already see marring her features, when he felt one of her hands find the nape of his neck, nails scraping his skin gently, as she pulled him back into another kiss, and shuffled closer to him. Khan groaned guiltily against her mouth, the friction eliciting tempting thoughts and chasing away his inhibitions. He grabbed her hips and shifted, bringing her above him as an unbearable heat pulled low in his loins. His now free hands roamed, carefully exploring her clothed body, trying to commit her shape to his memory, while a rising tide of self-hatred constricted his heart. What was he doing? He had to stop, he couldn't keep indulging himself, not now, that wasn't right. In the end, she was the one who broke the kiss, breathless. He expected her to leave it at that, shivering under her gaze while she watched him with half-closed lids, his body spread under her, tenderness and lust weaved strongly around their bond. I want you. His breath caught at the confession, his mind now foggy, hands trembling at the implications of her words ringing so true in the force. She removed her top, exposing her chest, and he mirrored her mechanically, his movements impeded by his position on the couch. She helped him with the last centimeters, her fingers trailing on his stomach in a way that made his skin shiver, then threw the garment on the ground and stilled for a moment. Khan thought at first that she was hesitating, realizing where all of this was leading, and was already straightening on the couch, in case she would want him to leave when she whispered, her cheeks burning and her eyes averted. I am not sure what to do next. His heart soared and his throat tightened, emotions he didn't care to entangle spreading softly in his veins. He wrapped his arms around her, pulling her against him, and kissed her temple. We don't have to do anything he replied, missing a breath when he met her gaze, full of trust and longing and nervosity. He had never wanted her more than in this moment. He had never been so afraid to hurt her either. I doubt I want to. Do you? She asked weakly, seeming suddenly very insecure sitting on his hips half naked. Why was he supposed to stop? 
he couldn't remember. Yes, he told her, closing his eyes when she kissed him again, breathing fire in his blood. She pushed him down softly, and he opened himself to the bond a bit more, burying his previous doubts and fears under his lust. Their desires floated in between them, tempting and evocative, and seemed to inspire her more than a thousand words. Her uncovered skin was warm and exciting against his, each touch is electrifying. She kissed his collarbones, her hands trailing lower and lower down his abdomen, and he struggled to remain in control of himself, as she found a particularly sensitive spot under his jaw. His callous hands roamed over her soft skin, savoring her shivers and turning her kisses even hungrier. He grabbed her hips when she started to grind against him, using his last bit of self-control to haul painfully the bliss-inducing gesture, and they locked eyes again. Let me know if it goes too far, I don't want to hurt you. She nodded, smiling softly, and he could feel her trust flow through the force. His heart swelled, aching against his chest and he pulled her flushed against him, savoring a much more tender kiss before removing their pants. After his intervention they moved slower, their pace more subdued, careful. His hands moved down, the bond, now pulsating stronger than ever, feeding him with detailed information on the exact effect of his actions, each gasp, moan, or shiver sparkling in the force like glittery flickers of pleasure, until he felt a curl inside her, her thighs spasming when he drove her over the edge. He let her come down of her high and decide if she wanted more, and shivered when she positioned herself on top of him, apparently more than ready to have him. The first motions of their now joined bodies made his fist clench on the cushion, infuriatingly slow and yet unbearably nice, and soon he stopped thinking entirely, drowning in the newly rediscovered sensations, his body entirely at her mercy. He barely lasted long enough to make her come again, drinking in the sight she offered as his own body tensed, his nerves overloaded with pleasure as his blood sang in sheer bliss. She settled against him afterward, tired and satisfied, and he wrapped his arms around her, enjoying the satisfying purr of their connection, and the feeling of her heart beating next to his. She didn't say anything, echoing his silence, and soon dozed off, her quiet breathing lulling him into drowsy relaxation. He refused to consider anything else, refused to address the lingering feeling of guilt and self-hatred that tainted his mind, and focused only on the pleasant afterglow of their afternoon activities. Maybe he didn't mind dancing all that much, in the end. The night had settled on Korskin since around an hour now and brought with her an unpleasant chill that made Qui-Gon Jin tighten his cloak around his tall form. He moved around the life day decorations adorning the narrow street, steps light, and cast a discreet look on his target. There had been sightings of members of the flail, and he and Obi-Wan had been sent to investigate and capture potential suspects for interrogation if needed. The flail hadn't been very active recently, suffering from the multiple arrests their unfortunate quest on Vir Jansi had led to, but Valorum was worried, and a worried Chancellor was an annoying one to serve under. He had been following a thug he recognized from the files they had on the active members of the organization, hoping to quiet Valorum's concerns with at least one arrest before Life Day, but the Weekway had so far only been going from store to store to purchase gifts, and even the Force felt bored. He derived some pedigree he held on to far too long for a GD, from the fact that Obi-Wan, Mace Windu, and Deepa Balaba, Mace's former Padawan and newly anointed council member after he had refused to take the chair, were probably also cold and wary from tailing their own targets. Frankly. Two council members, one master and a soon-to-be knight to investigate people doing their life day shopping. He couldn't even begin to understand how Mace had agreed to this. Was Valorum this scared for his life? Qui-Gon followed him home to a small apartment a couple of levels down, watching crouch between two fragrant bins that must have held some sort of decaying fishes, as the thug hid the gifts in his closet and joined what looked like his partner for a late dinner, while their young ones slept in the next room. He listened to their conversations, something about school and homework, and getting an additional job to send the oldest to a summer camp later that year, and was about to call it a night, aching for a warm cup of gadolentin tea and the comfort of his soft bed, when his hair stood on his nape. It felt like suddenly, he wasn't the one watching, but the one being watched. Frowning, he kept himself still and let his awareness extend, searching for the cause of the warning he could hear in the force. There was a flicker, like a dying, dark ember glowing faintly, and when he probed at it, it sparked a tad fiercer before nearly disappearing again. Whatever this was, he knew quite gone was aware of him. Ajiti's jaw clenched and he sprang out of his hiding spot, the chase much more interesting than his previous activities. He ran, following the ember in the force, his lungs burning from the cold air and the mad dash, but just managed to see the corner of a dark cloak, before the presence completely vanished. Qui-Gon stopped, alone in the icy evening, panting. His heart was beating wildly, his plans for tea and rest forgotten. Whatever this was, for a second it had felt exactly like the dark presence he had sensed before his dinner with Anya. Anya was freaking out. After reflecting on it for a few hours now and researching the whole net a tad frantically during a fake refresher break she knew, in theory, that she probably had done nothing particularly offending earlier. 
according to her own understanding of it, and the detailed descriptions of the usual proceedings she had found online. Their afternoon intercourse on the couch had been both consensual, enthusiastically consensual, even, and extremely unoriginal. Khan hadn't expressed any vocal regret about it, and he seemed to have enjoyed it just as much as she had. Actually, Anya had been rather happy about how unproblematic the entire thing had been, especially considering that the body she inhabited had never done anything of the sort. She had expected her first time with Khan to be either painful or traumatic or both, dire memories obliged, and had somehow imagined that with time and practice, she would get used to it, and that she just had to endure it the first few times until her body and mind adjusted. As it turned out, with someone who genuinely didn't want to hurt her, someone who cared, it could be the exact opposite of painful and traumatic. At most, she had felt a bit awkward not really knowing what he expected, and what she was supposed to do once past the makeout stage. A small inconvenience, considering the rest of the experience had exceeded all of her romantic expectations. Khan had made her feel confident, strong, and beautiful. He had made her feel loved, and just thinking back on it was enough to send please flutters down her stomach, and make her heart miss a beat. But after napping in each other's embrace for the rest of the afternoon, basking in lazy satisfaction in more dried sweat than she would have been comfortable with in any other situation, they had separated to clean out and dress, before going to meet the Count for dinner, and Khan had since been muted at best. The Andaku had obviously noticed, but politely chose not to point it out, probably thinking they had a small fight. She wasn't mad about it, truly the minute she walked in the dining room, she had been convinced he could read on her face how naughty their afternoon had been, so having him avoiding the subject entirely was quite nice, but it made the entire meal rather awkward. In the end, she was left having to do most of the talking, repressing her fierce urge to viciously stab her vegetables with her fork in annoyance. They had spent a good chunk of time speaking about the annual parade and official dinner that would take place on Life Day, two days from now, discussing the organization and requirements of the event in between bites. The Helios Sohop team had sent her uncle pictures of the outfits they had planned to bring to the fitting, in order to help him make the first selection, and she gave her opinion on the choices he had forwarded her earlier that day, a hollow mail she had received, while looking at very compromising material in the refresher during her little investigation earlier. They went over various contentious points regarding the parade, and Duku had asked her if she was done with the seating plan for the dinner. Dreadfully boring. After exhausting this topic, not garnering even a second of true attention from her sulking boyfriend, Deku started to ask her some rather pointed questions on her senate work, inquiring about the next bill she was going to endorse, how her charity work was going, and if the latest gossip on Chancellor Valorum had any sort of truth to it. No, he has been targeted harshly these last few months, but none of it is true she replied with a placating smile, put off by the rather hostile vibe that came out of him. It was ridiculous, really, he was the one that mentioned Valorum. She cast a discreet glance at Khan, but he was playing with his piece, seemingly absent. No support there. Fine. Whatever. There's no smoke without fire, my niece. Valorum is a relic of an ancient time and a paper pusher. Perhaps it would be wise to reconsider how your proximity can be perceived he told her in that patronizing voice she poured. What he said wasn't untrue, but that had never disturbed her uncle before. Why would he try to discourage her from supporting Valorum now? She pushed back lightly. I'm hardly close to the Chancellor, Uncle Yan, I support the faction, not the man. Public division would diminish the party's strength, and public rejection of the Chancellor would only benefit the Rim faction and ruin our efforts on several laws we need to pass before the end of his term. It was complete banta crap, but it sounded true enough. Deku sighed. Be careful, Anya, perceptions can be warped, and they often matter more than the truth. He let go after that, but it was a clear warning, and she had trouble hiding her frown while she thought back on his words. Why would he suddenly discourage her from associating with the Chancellor? He had always seemed perfectly content with letting her make her own choices in politics, giving her the freedom she needed to maneuver in the Senate, as long as it benefited Sereno. Her hand tightened around her fork. Someone had given him orders. Someone that wanted Valorum alone. They spent the rest of the meal in relative silence, the air now so heavy one could cut it with a knife until, finally, Duku retired for the evening. Now freaking out twice as much, her stomach twisted in worry, she followed Khan back to their quarters, hoping for some quality talk in front of the fire like they had the night before, but he apparently had other things in mind, and quickly retired in his room after a mumbled greeting, leaving her alone and at least a tiny bit hurt. She sat on the couch for a moment, her bottom lip trembling and her heart aching in her chest, refusing to cry. Her shoulders shook, agitated by ugly sobs, and she hid her face in the cushion, trying to regain control over herself. Okay, maybe she was more than a tiny bit hurt. Had she done something wrong? Had it been super lame for him? What was his problem? Couldn't they talk about it if he was uncomfortable with what they had done? Was he having second thoughts about being in a relationship with her? 
she could have wallowed in self-pity and let her disappointment take over, ordering some sweets from the kitchen against Serenian tradition, and crying silently in front of the final season of Brides and Bias, where after many adventures Prince Adger finally ended up with years, and tried to get married, despite the court ferocious opposition, and quite a lot of murder attempts from the stable girl. Who had become Igor's apprentice and was still but heard about his rejection in season 3. She was, however, trying to be a mature and communicating adult, and she had already watched it twice, so she chose instead to wallow in self-pity, while doing her nighttime routine, with the firm intention of going to confront him afterward. Unsurprisingly, she ended up spending a considerable amount of time seated against the tiles of the refresher, with stinging eyes and a snotty nose. Once in pajamas and feeling stable enough, she ordered some hot cocoa for them both before going to check on the avoiding man-child she had decided to pick as a partner. Armed with nothing but her bravery, a good amount of annoyance, and two mugs of warm chocolate, already feeling ridiculous in her checkered winter pajamas, and relatively sore from the high amount of physical activity she had done earlier, she knocked on his door and waited for a reply. After two knocks, the second one a tad stronger than the first, she heard some sort of muffled answer that sounded mildly positive and entered. Khan was spread out on his bed, still wearing his dinner outfit minus the shoes, and was looking at the ceiling with a blank expression. Promising. She stopped near the bed, putting both mugs on the nightstand, and he turned his head towards her with an indifferent expression and a somewhat harsh glare. He didn't want her here. Her heart clenched painfully in her chest, and she fought back her urge to flee. She was a mature adult, and running away from whatever this was would not help solve whatever issue he had with her. Thankfully, his gaze mellowed considerably once he took in the pajama and sweet scent. I thought the Serenian rule was no sweet things after breakfast. She shrugged, her excuse already ready. It's always breakfast time somewhere in this galaxy. Khan smiled, his first agreeable expression since quite a few hours now, and sat up at the head of the bed before patting the spot next to him, inviting her to join him. She settled against his flank, handing him one of the warm cups before grabbing the other, and waited for him to start sipping quietly before attacking with the question that burned her lips. Are you okay? She asked, unable to keep the concern she felt out of her voice. He stiffened next to her and let out a soft sigh. She could nearly sense him trying to organize his thoughts and bless his therapist for the amazing work he did with him. A few months ago he would just have shut down and straight out, refused to talk about his feelings, until he could push it all away with enough efficiency to appear normal again. I am happy he finally confided, his tone uneasy. She got the subtext by meshing how disturbed he felt in the force with her knowledge of him and of his past. Khan had hated himself all his life. As Anakin, he had been too much for the GD to handle and despise his differences and perceived flaws. As Vader he had failed to protect everything he held dear, nearly killing his wife in his quest for power, torturing his daughter for a master he hated, and having that same master killing his son under his eyes. He didn't think that he deserved any true happiness in his personal relationships, after screwing up that bad before. He felt unlovable, unworthy, and guilty. He knew he could mess up again, and he felt terrible at the thought of destroying her in the process like he had destroyed everything the first time. In more than one way, the intimate moment they had shared had induced in Khan the exact opposite of what it had in her, and she had been completely oblivious about it. Anya put her head on his shoulder, ashamed of her previous annoyance with him, and tried to convey support. He relaxed, his dark feelings unwinding slightly, and kissed the top of her head with a sweetness that split her own walls open with tremendous strength. Whispering, she poured out her own insecurities. Do you regret it? If he answered yes, it would break her heart, but there was something in her, something growing steadily with each second they spent together, itchy and reckless and precious, that needed to know. He took a sip of hot chocolate before answering, and her anxiety rose in the silence that stretched between them, making her throat tighten nearly painfully as he examined his feelings. No. I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't been sure of what I felt. Her heart started beating faster, and her cheeks reddened under the implied declaration. Something she hadn't been fully conscious of loosened in her chest, filling her with bubbly joy. Apparently unaware of the pleasure his words brought her, she felt some curiosity and anguish coming from him, and the unworthy feeling swole again in the force. Do you? She shook her head vigorously and turned to look at him. No. It was great. You thought she shivered, having never been this specific with what happened to her, though she suspected he had at least doubts after her behavior on Corbin, and her lousy explanation after Sojourn. You're the first person I've been with willingly she added in a whisper. Khan's jaw clenched and something angry exploded in the force, hissing and spitting and growling menacingly. His fury felt dark and protective, swirling around her as if to separate her from any potential threat, caressing her skin in an equally hot and cold feeling, that left her breathless under its intensity. It was easy, sometimes, to forget who he was, to see him as the others did, a brilliant student, a brilliant GD, and overall a brilliant young man with a glowing future. In that moment, however, despite the hot chocolate, the checkered pajamas, and the subtle confession that still lingered in the air, she could feel Khan as he truly was. 
The power rang in her ears like a roar, nearly as free as she had sensed it on Corb in her sojourn, where there had been no life forms pushing him to restrain himself as much as he usually did. She could feel the strings connecting the universe trembling, fragile, and easily frayed by the sheer intensity of his power. It was humbling to sit in the eye of that hurricane of potent darkness, one that could level planets at a whim and kill with a thought. Strangely enough though, she had never felt as protected as she did in that exact moment. Slowly, trying not to startle him, she leaned towards him and put a hand on his shoulder. His eyes glinted gold, his face serious, but when he looked at her worried face his expression softened, the righteous fury receding slightly, leaving room for compassion and sadness for what he thought had happened to her. Sighing, she decided to go all the way, now that he was able to truly listen. If they were to be together, he would have to know anyway. When he moved me from this to the Imperial Palace, and I learned about the proclamation of the Empire, I became rebellious. Sidious tried his usual tortures, but it didn't work, so he sent one of his guards after me. I was foolish and convinced he truly fell for me. I suppose they waited until I was fully in love with him before breaking me with the truth. It wasn't enough, so he kept coming until I fell pregnant. She paused, her free hand clenched on her pajama, and pushed away the growing distress she felt at recounting the events. Now that she had started, she wanted it all out, she was tired of being silent, of keeping this a secret. She was not the one in the wrong there. She shouldn't have to be quiet. She shouldn't have to feel ashamed of anything, they should. She had done nothing wrong, and as painful as speaking was, she could already feel each word leaving her mouth soothing her soul. Carter said it was to see if my powers were hereditary, but I think it was just another sick game. I couldn't have the child, not when I knew what his fate was going to be, it was too cruel. I stole a knife, or they let me have it, and I tried to kill myself. I only killed the baby, but I damaged myself too much to have another one. She let out a small bitter laugh. Palpatine was furious. Khan stayed silent but took her hand, pressing it slowly, as hot tears finally fell on her cheeks, nearly purifying at this point. He still felt enraged on her behalf, his eyes not gold yet not blue, but he was purposely fighting against it to stay supportive to her, and the same not quite itch growing in her chest, that got her into this tough conversation in the first place got stronger. Somewhat amused by her own shortcomings, she removed her hand from his shoulder to wipe her cheeks, and flashed him a smile that didn't quite reach her eyes. I'm sorry, I came here to check on you, and I'm the one crying. Don't be. I'm grateful for your trust. He pulled her in his arms, the empty mugs long forgotten on the nightstand, and she could feel his heart beating against her ear, the sound deeply calming. I vow never to betray it. His murmur made her forget how to breathe for a few seconds, and she gasped, sensing through the force their bond gained another strand, a near unbreakable one, as the higher power connecting the entire universe took note of his commitment and sealed it. Entranced by the feeling, she whispered to his heart what hers was now screaming. I vow never to betray yours. I love you, Khan. He held her tighter as the bond gained yet another strand. He never said it back, but the overwhelming tide of emotions that came back her way told her he heard her words, and he loved her too. Elise was not having the best time of her life. It was a shame, the weather was amazing, the snow perfect, and their parents left the girls alone enough for them to mingle at the local cantina with some cute boys and warm wine. She was playing with the zipper of her pretty silver snow combi, bored out of her mind, as some sleek haired core scanty boy tried to get into her pants, by reciting what she thought to be his parents' fiscal statement. Kay and Bor, her two friends, both looked occupied laughing with their respective dates, like they had a tremendous amount of fun while she sat there, wallowing in misery. Truth to be told it was not the fault of the core scanty boy. In other circumstances, she would have probably drunk his words like sweet syrup, and might even have believed she genuinely liked him. He was good looking enough, maybe a tad bland, and even if he was no genius he at least gravitated in the same circles as her. No, it could have worked, if she hadn't been utterly fixated on Khan and his gorgeous girlfriend. She had been stupid to believe Jang's words, at least the dumb part of it. Apparently, Khan's relationship with the Serenian senator was not only alive but thriving. She stifled a sob and downed a big gulp of her blueberry wempa, the thought carving through her skin with familiar pain. Khan had seemed to warm up to her this year, he looked more open, less taciturn, and she had secretly dreamed that eventually, with enough work, she could have warmed her way into his heart. Of course, seeing him with Ani Duku had significantly doused her hopes. He was so sweet, so caring with her, so thoughtful in his behavior, like she was the most precious treasure of this galaxy, and needed to be revered as such. She criffing hated that bitch. What did she have that Ailes did not? Ailes took another sip of her drink, relishing in the burning sensation of the alcohol passing down her throat. She was being hypocritical, she knew quite well what Ani had that she did not, she had done her research after Kay recognized the girl. Countess Ani Duku of House Sereno, Senator at 17, eminent representative of the core faction, friend of the Chancellor, heiress to the Serenian throne, ambassador of Helios Sohab. 
main responsible for the creation of the Galactic Flight Academy. All of the people at school were raving about, and a renowned benefactor participating in frequent release missions and diverse charity initiatives to better the galaxy. Just thinking about it made Ailey's want to puke. If only she was ugly, or she had a bad personality, or literally anything, but the tall and pretty blonde was renowned for her kind, a severe, disposition, and had no known weakness, apart from a peculiar habit of having what were most likely business dinners with older men, that made the tabloids go crazy. She had been spotted with Chancellor Valorum, various senators including Senator Fang Di Selenia and Senator Bail Antilles, and a mysterious Master Jidi with long hair and a beard. It had been disheartening to say the least to learn that some girls were literally living her dream life on Coruscant while she was struggling to pass her flight tests, and that the same girl had the audacity to steal her crush from her. What did she even find in Khan that she couldn't find in the endless list of suitors she probably had? Ailey's knew she liked Khan because he was the mysterious type, silent and handsome and utterly inaccessible, quietly superior to everyone else in their age group. He never bragged about his good results, never complained about his supposedly rough upbringing, and was never involved in any drama. Khan was perfect in her eyes, but Ailey's was not a powerful foreign dignitary. And she brought him back with her for life day. What was Khan? A gender-bent holodrama heroine. The low-life peasant charming the princess, triumphing over adversity thanks to the great qualities of his heart, becoming the king and living happily ever after. The galaxy didn't work that way. It never did for her, so why should it be any different for Khan? Plus if Anya Duku had to play any role in a holodrama, she would definitely be the overpowered villain that was bewitching the hero, and needed to be defeated by the humble but brave heroine, and she knew it wasn't just her bitterness speaking this time. That girl had a mean glare. The coarse candy boy put his hand on her thigh, and she didn't push him away, even if the contact left her feeling dirty. He was now speaking of his excellent relationships within various shipyards, since she had told him earlier she was attending Towervin's piloting academy. Do you know Khan Vayner? I heard he is from Towervin too. She nearly spat out her drink and nodded. In sense, the boy pressed her leg a tad harder, making her wince, and ordered them two more drinks. My father spent two weeks raving about him after he sent his first observations to KDY. He says he is a genius he added somewhat sourly. Someone had daddy issues. How unsurprising. She wanted his hand off her leg, but repressed the urge to slap it, feeling there was more to his little tail than what he had already told her. He is like, super quiet at school, but he is the best of our year for sure she replied in a sugary tone, batting her long, dark eyelashes at him. He huffed, and she wanted to slap his smug look off his face. He could have at least manifested some sort of wonder at the show she offered. Asshole. Are you kidding? He got the personal recommendation of the chairman of the banking clan, and according to my father, the guy is the best there is in the galaxy. I heard Lyra Blissex is already shitting her pants. Apparently getting down on your knees pay. Elise finished her drink in one go before answering, and put it back rather harshly on the table, her mind whirling with questions and a faint sense of anger. First of all, how ironic that the very person she wanted to use to distract herself from Khan, would talk to her about him. Secondly, what was this thing with the banking clan? Thirdly, Khan got on his knees for a position. What was this prick even implying? The chairman of the banking clan. He hummed approvingly and handed her the new glass. Yeah, father says they just crossed path on Coruscant, and he helped him with his ship or whatever, but knowing Muins, he wouldn't have recommended him for free. I'm sure this con guy did some private repairs for the chairman, if you see what I mean. She stored the information away preciously and tried not to cringe when the Coruscanti boy started mimicking what exactly he thought Khan had done to the Muin, while groping her disgustingly. She would endure it for tonight, just in case he had more details. Sipping her free drink and repressing a shiver of displeasure, Ailee started plotting. Maybe it was time she and Jang had a little conversation. If she could not have Khan now, she could at least make sure Anya didn't want him. Perhaps he would see, then, how valuable she was. 